Uh, today's presentation will be approximately an hour in length, including time for a question and answer session at the end. You'll be able to submit questions by typing them into the question box on your screen. You can submit questions at any time. They will be answered at the end of the webcast. Today's webinar will be recorded and linked to the recording, and all the material viewed will be sent via email to attendees as well as to those who could not attend. Presenting today's webinar is Bill Anderson, Vice President of Best Practices and E-Notarization with the National Notary Association. Bill? Thank you, Dwayne, and thank you, everyone. Uh, we appreciate your patience this morning as we worked out a few technical glitches getting online with you today. Uh, we're happy to have you here today with our uh, June 2011 webinar. Uh, today's webinar is on the topic of notary liability. We have a special guest with us this morning who knows all about notary liability because as an attorney, it is his job to represent notaries and claims for a notary's error or misconduct has resulted in financial loss or an allegation of a loss. Richard Bush from the Richard S. Bush Law Firm here in Southern California is with us. Richard graduated from Loyola Law School in 1981. He was a partner in the LA firm of Anderson, McFarland, and Connors that specializes in surety litigation from 1985 to 1992. He was chief legal officer at Amwa Surety Insurance Company from 1993 to 2002, where he handled all types of surety cases. Richard now has his own law practice in Westlake Village, California, where he focuses primarily on representing notaries with errors and emissions insurance policies here in Southern California. Notaries with errors and emissions insurance uh, policies keeps him very busy here in the Southland. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Richard Bush. Richard, welcome and thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Bill, and I want to thank all the participants in this webinar. I believe that this should be a, a very fruitful event uh, for all of uh, the notaries who are uh, listening. The format of today's webinar will be different than past webinars. I will be interviewing Richard, and Richard will be doing most of the talking. At the end of our interview, we'll plan to leave about 10 minutes or so to take your questions. So if you have a question at any time during the presentation, please type it in your questions box in your GoToMeeting interface. In submitting your question, please tell us what state you're from. Uh, keep in mind that while Richard represents California notaries, and his frame of reference uh, is in California law, much of what he says will apply to notaries of any state. Uh, Richard has graciously agreed to give out his email address to us uh, at, at the webinar today. So if we don't get to your question, you can write Richard uh, directly and he will respond to you. We'll provide his email address at the close of the webinar. So let's go ahead and get started. I don't know. Keep going. So uh, let's go ahead and launch the um, uh, poll question. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, please tell us if this is your first NSA webinar. Uh, tell us if you have attended uh, one previous NSA webinars or have attended more than two NSA webinars or perhaps you've attended more than three. And we'll go ahead and let you vote. And uh, we'll go ahead and close the poll in a couple of seconds. Go ahead and close the poll, Dwayne. And let's see what the results are. Go ahead and show the results. 66% uh, uh, of you are here for the very first time. And uh, we're, we're grateful to have you here. Uh, and we have uh, an equal number of you who have been with us either one, two, or three times. So thank you. Go ahead. Thank you for sharing uh, with us. So uh, let me go over with you briefly what the goals are for today's presentation. We'd like to first of all talk about claims, that is cases resulting in claims against notaries, what notaries did or did not do wrong. Then we want to talk a little bit about what notaries should do and not do if they are involved in the claim. And then thirdly, protection. Uh, what notaries can do to protect themselves against claims. So as we 
uh, go ahead. We're going to launch the second poll question and ask you to go ahead and answer this question. Uh, which of the following does not typically result in claims against notaries? Uh, is it home rescue frauds, elder abuse cases, loan modifications, or powers of attorney? Let's see what you think, and then after you vote, we'll ask Richard uh, to, to tell us what his experience is. We'll give you a couple um, uh, more seconds here to vote, to uh, register your choice there, and we'll go ahead and close the poll in about five seconds. And go ahead, Dwayne, and, and, and close the poll. Thanks for that. And uh, about 36% of you said that elder abuse cases uh, represent claims against notaries. About 25% of you said home rescue frauds. And 23% of you said powers of attorney. And 15% of you said uh, a lot of loan modification. So Richard, let's go ahead and, and ask you um, the question, what are the types of cases that result in claims against a notary's bond or e &O insurance policy? Richard? Thank you, Bill. And actually that poll question was kind of a quick uh, trick question because all of those uh, uh, items do result in claims and they largely involve some type of real estate fraud. Uh, as most of the participants know, that uh, virtu uh, all real estate transactions uh, need to be recorded, uh, and therefore, uh, typically, a notary is involved in that process. Uh, the, the, the vast majority of these cases involve forged deeds, and there's a variety of different uh, types of cases I, I run into in that context, but uh, again, the, the, the forged deeds and their nuances that relate to loan modification efforts. Um, there's elder abuse uh, involvement where the uh, alleged victim lacked capacity and there's uh, forgeries of powers of attorney that have provided uh, uh, the, uh, the culprit the ability to uh, obtain title to a property pursuant to that power of attorney. Alright, so now uh, taking a look at the uh, typical a claim, Richard, why don't you run through what typically happens? Well, what typically happens is there is an innocent homeowner and somehow uh, there is a forged deed that has been obtained that grants title to uh, a third party. That third party will usually go out and obtain a loan and there again there's another potential forged trust deed involved in, in that loan, and then we get a uh, lawsuit uh, from a number of different sources, the first source being the homeowner who's uh, been the victim of uh, identity theft and forgery. The second uh, likely claimant is the lender and the title insurer who, uh, after realizing that the, uh, the, the uh, deed was forged, no longer has security in the real estate uh, uh, to secure the loan. And uh, what happens then is there's uh, typically a lawsuit that results in a number of claims against, among others, the notary because the notary is always on the deed. And they're very easily to locate and identify through the California Secretary of State in California and also the county recorder. All right, and so the, um, the victim uh, at some point finds out about this. They, they weren't uh, aware of it uh, up to a point, they find out, and then who do they go after usually? Well, they'll uh, usually go after the lender uh, in the event that they find out that there's been a loan that's been procured. They'll go after the person who's acquired title, uh, but also they'll go after the notary because, again, the, if the notary has forged or been involved in a forgery, uh, then uh, the notary is right there on the deed that, that conveyed the property. Okay, great. Now, so Richard, uh, our next question for you is, what are the acts that notaries typically commit that result in claims? Well, and as, as hard as it is to, to believe, uh, I'm, I'm assuming most of the notaries in this audience comply with uh, their notarial duties uh, with, uh, with vigilance, but uh, a typical case uh, would involve um, someone notarizing a deed when the person in fact has not appeared in front of them. 
Uh, I had a case where uh, a person uh, came to our notary, had his uh, wife's identification, claimed the wife was in jail in Tijuana, and he needed to get title to the property that the wife had already signed a grantee to, to the husband uh, in order to post bail for that, uh, uh, that uh, for the wife to get out of jail. Of course, what happened was they were in a divorce proceeding. The husband had obtained uh, the wife's identification and duped the notary. Um, I, I have another case where uh, a long-term family friend uh, uh, goes to the notary. The notary had known the, the mother and father and the daughter forever. The daughter comes to the, the, uh, the notary and says, my mom's in the hospital. We need to get this done immediately. Presents her with a signed deed uh, from uh, her parents and says that the parents will come in later that day to sign the notary journal. The notary, having all the faith in the world in, in uh, this family, goes ahead and notarizes uh, the deed, despite the fact that the person did not show. Uh, second common uh, situation is where there's a fake ID involved and uh, that's why it's so important for notaries to uh, very uh, carefully review the identification, make sure it's an identification that's allowed by law. Typically in California it's the driver's license. But again, if uh, there's a fake ID uh, or an ina inadequate ID, that will lead to a, um, a claim against the notary. Uh, a third case is uh, where a notary seal has gotten into the wrong hands. And I uh, just had a recent case where uh, our, our notary uh, almost for sure did not notarize the document. It was an allegedly forged uh, deed. But when the police went to the notary's office to uh, investigate, the notary wasn't there, but someone else was. And the policeman asked the, uh, the other person uh, for the notary journal, and the other person went behind the desk and handed him the journal. Oh, really? But then uh, the police said, well, where's the seal? The notary went behind the desk and handed uh, the, the officer the seal as well, despite the fact that the notary wasn't even there. Uh, obviously, there's a significant need for the notary to comply with the law to safeguard the seal at all costs, make sure it doesn't get into the wrong hands. Uh, the last typical uh, event is when there's something that raises the suspicion. If there, I, I had a, a case where if it just doesn't seem right, you should probably not notarize uh, the document. Uh, in one case, our notary was uh, called to a hotel at 6 o'clock in the morning. The person who was uh, there to be notarized had blood on his shirt. Turns out there was a, a, a murder and uh, that person had obtained the, uh, an identification of that person. And it may have been a fake ID, we don't know, but the fact that a notary would, in a situation where there was seemingly a lot of reasons to suspect whether the, the, the transaction was going to be legitimate, nevertheless notarized uh, the document. Well, so now that you have us all on uh, the edges of our, of our seats, what happened in that case? Uh, involving the, the murder. Well, I um, uh, thankfully I got I got the notary out because uh, there, there there in fact was no real estate transaction involved. It was the power of attorney, and the uh, situation was that the people went to a, a bank and pulled out all the assets from the bank. Uh, we actually settled the case at a, a fairly inexpensive uh, amount. Um, so it was a, a good ending, but it could have been a disaster. And furthermore, thankfully, the notary did comply with all his duties, uh, and the thumbprint that he obtained al allowed the uh, police to, uh, in fact, locate the murderer. So it was a good result, but it could have been a disaster. Okay. And, and so, so suspicious events um, when something isn't right. Uh, what about this, this, this last item here about the, the signer not showing a capacity to sign? Well, and you know, these, these are always difficult cases for notaries. If they're uh, called upon to notarize for an elderly or sick person, you know, oftentimes people need to do notarial transactions uh, when, when someone's old. But if a person does not appear like they are 
uh, well enough or in a mental state sufficient to understand what they're signing. Uh, it's better to, to take a, a long, hard look at the situation before you notarize the deed. Okay, good, thanks. Okay, so uh, the next question, Richard, is how does the typical case unfold? How do you, with a notary, find out uh, about the claim? Well, I um, will usually get a call uh, from the bonding company or the errors and omission insurance company. And uh, what usually happens is that company will have received either a notification from the notary who's been served with a lawsuit or a claim, or they've been served directly with a lawsuit. The bonding company has been sued. Uh, they refer the case over to me. They will notify the notary and I will immediately uh, contact the notary uh, and uh, do all my diligence to find out uh, the, the evidence of the case, uh, getting a copy of the notary journal, finding out what the facts and circumstances are. My next uh, involvement will be to contact counsel and uh, communicate and hopefully convince them that our notary did nothing wrong or uh, through all the experience I've had, try to massage the case to uh, work out a settlement uh, where uh, the notary can uh, be extricated without uh, much, uh, much money or much loss. So what does, how does the notary find out? Well, the notary, uh, because, as I said earlier, the notary is usually the first party to get served in a lawsuit because their name and identification, uh, a commission number is right on the deed. So they're so, going to get some sort of a, uh, they're going to be served with papers from the court, uh, a process server will come along and show up on the door one day and hand them uh, the suit. That's right. Or they've received a call from an attorney or the plaintiff or the claimant saying, you know, we need some facts and evidence what happened here. Mm -hmm. And we can get into what the proper response is a little later on in yeah. this discussion. Now, with regard to uh, cases involving a forged deed and a loan, how do those typically unfold? Well, as I uh, mentioned previously, and this is probably not the, pretty much the majority of cases where the, the, there's been a, a criminal who has obtained title to the property uh, from an innocent uh, homeowner through a forgery. Uh, that person, uh, the criminal, will go and uh, go to a lender and uh, obtain a, a loan. And usually, unfortunately, loans are in uh, a large amount of money, so they're big money cases. Uh, and uh, so then we get a situation where typically the homeowner doesn't even know there's been a loan. Uh, and the first notice they get is a notice that their house is being foreclosed because obviously the criminal is not going to be making payments on that loan for at least uh, very long. Sometimes they'll pay the loan for a while just to uh, buy time in order to uh, decrease the money that they've obtained and or um, get out of uh, town. Mm -hmm. And so um, with regard to those cases where there is the forged deed involved but no loan. Yeah, those are uh, interesting cases. We don't see as many of those and those oftentimes involve the loan modification and home rescue situation. And so sometimes the suspicion is that really the homeowner uh, is not telling the truth when they say there was a forgery or that they were not in on it. But what will happen is the property is either conveyed entirely or a percentage of the property is conveyed to a third party. And uh, oftentimes the, um, that third party will then uh, file a bankruptcy proceeding in order to stop a foreclosure. So usually uh, in those cases my experience is that the, uh, the real owner is in a financial distress, is facing foreclosure to begin with. Um, but those are cases that are usually easier to resolve because if there hasn't been a loan, the amount of damages that uh, have been suffered are significantly less. Okay, great. Thanks for that. So what's the typical amount of time between when the act giving rise to the claim occurs and when the claim is filed or the notary is served? And, you know, that can vary uh, dramatically depending on the facts and circumstances of the case. Uh, lately, uh, especially here in Southern California, with the rampant amount of real estate fraud, uh, the county recorders uh, are immediately sending out to the original homeowner a notification when a quick claim deed, a grant deed, 
or I think even a trust deed has been recorded against their property. So within, I think within 30 days, the homeowner find, should be able to find out about uh, what may have been a forged deed that is basically stolen their property from them. And so in that, that event, they sometimes will hire an attorney very quickly and uh, hopefully before there's even been uh, any loan obtained, uh, will have um, filed an action which is called a quiet title action to basically uh, free the property from the uh, fraudulent uh, deed. Okay, great, thanks. So um, we have a poll question for the audience. So let's go ahead and launch the poll. The poll is how long do you think a notary is liable for misconduct? Uh, is it one year, three years, five years, or 10 years? Why don't you take a crack at that poll question and uh, then we'll have Richard respond. So go ahead, a number of you are voting. We'll um, give you uh, a little bit more time. And we'll go ahead and close the poll in about five seconds. And we'll go ahead and close the poll. Dwayne, go ahead, thank you, and share that result with us. 49% uh, of you say that the, uh, the case can be uh, up to 10 years uh, in filing, or the, liable, the liability of the notary is for 10 years. And uh, many of you said at least five years. So thank you for uh, going ahead and taking uh, that poll question. So let me uh, go ahead and uh, ask Richard uh, to, to tell us what is the statute of limitations for notary con misconduct. And we'll preface this by reminding everybody that, that this is um, the California statute in, in particular that Richard's going to talk about. Yes, and, and thank you, Bill, for making sure people understand. The laws mm -hmm. of each state are going to differ with regards to this, and it's not a very easy uh, solution to determine statute of limitations not because the statute isn't clear, um, because it basically is that you have three years from the date of the notarial misconduct uh, to uh, sue. But uh, the, the, the variables that, uh, relate to the one-year discovery um, uh, section of the statute. So you can have longer than three years if you did not discover the, uh, the, the notarial misconduct until uh, a later date. And uh, uh, the, the, one of the difficulties in the analysis on statute of limitation is who is making the claim. As I mentioned earlier, there are a number of different potential claimants. If it's the aggrieved homeowner, uh, they probably have, sh should have found out about the notarial misconduct within, let's say, the first year. However, if they don't need to file a lawsuit for potentially a, not a couple years, and if there was a loan involved, then the, law, the lender may not have discovered the notarial misconduct until year three or four. So that's why the longest period in California from the date of notarial misconduct is six years, but it's the, whatever is latest period, whether it's three years from the date of the act or one year from the date of discovery, whichever is latest. Yeah, and I, you know, just uh, we're seeing still uh, cases against notaries uh, for misconduct or uh, errors that occurred back in 2006, even as we speak. Oh, and it, you know, it amazes me. I uh, oftentimes uh, wonder how I, <laughs> I just get upset because I can't get these notaries out on statute of limitations defenses. Uh, but it, it can vary so much, and lawyers are, can be very creative because what they, they have what they call DOE amendments. So they may have filed a lawsuit that didn't name the notary or even allege notarial misconduct. But if they can go that party in at a later date, then they can relate back to the original filing date. Okay, thank you for that. And again, for your particular statute of limitations, you'll need to consult your state law for those of you who are not uh, here uh, in California. So, Richard, what are the typical damage that we're talking about here that are awarded in claims when the notary is found liable? Well, as I said uh, previously, the a majority of the cases are real estate fraud cases, and a good portion of those involve very large loans. And mm -hmm. if the plaintiff, the claimant, or the lender can establish that the notarial misconduct uh, has caused them damages, then the notary is going to be responsible for the entirety of those damages. 
And uh, again, it is a two-pronged test, at least in California. You can't just show that the notary screwed up. You have to show that that misconduct led to damages. And so fairly frequently, I can argue that while the notary did screw up, it did not proximately cause the damages that are being um, claimed. Uh, um, besides just, for example, the amount of the loan, um, there's also the legal fees that were incurred. Uh, so in a, in a case where, let's say, there hasn't been a loan obtained and the attorney uh, for the homeowner has had to file a suit to quiet title, to clear the title of the, the loan or the, uh, the, the forged deed from the title, uh, then the, the notary is going to be uh, responsible for those legal fees and costs. Um, and there's a multitude of, uh, of other damage theories that attorneys can come up with uh, to expand the damages, but it, 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 it can be an am, am, amazing amount of damages that are, our notaries are exposed to. And uh, tell us a little bit about uh, punitive damages. Well, those and, come into play. And I assume everyone knows what punitive damages are. Those are uh, damages basically to punish the person or to set an example. And so we're not talking about if a no notary has done something wrong uh, and you know you could say oh that was intentional we're not talking about intentional uh, misconduct as being when the notary was just negligent in failing to get uh, a proper identification for example but if the notary was in fact participating in the fraud then they're subjecting themselves to punitive damages to punish them and uh, you know typically uh, the notaries I'm defending aren't in that category, because if they were in fact participating in the fraud, they probably uh, skipped town uh, as well, because they know they did something wrong. All right, this next uh, s slide is uh, an interesting one. Um, let's uh, talk about how you approach a typical uh, case uh, involving a real estate loan and, and how e and and the bond come into play. Well, there's uh, a number of different scenarios. Uh, most frequently, I guess my case is involved where there's both a bond that's been issued by uh, my by, by the bonding company uh, that also issued an errors and omissions policy. And so there's two different amounts at stake. Um, and uh, in those instances, my clear objective, if there is uh, notarial misconduct, is to uh, get involved very quickly with counsel, try to work out a, a solution that will settle the case uh, for less than the amount of the E&O policy. Because uh, if, if that occurs, then there will be no exposure on the bond, and uh, we can deal with the consequences of a bond loss uh, later. But, uh, but in, in any event, that's my primary objective. Sometimes, uh, as amazing as it sounds, the attorneys for these claimants do not even know about a bond. They just sue the notary, and sometimes they assume they don't have to sue the bonding company, and I'm certainly not going to educate them. So sometimes when in a case of clear notarial li liability, I can settle for uh, an amount um, which is less than the amount of the bond, which is $15,000, and extricate both the notary and the bonding company. Um, and so that, that obviously is a, an ideal situation uh, when uh, the attorney for the, 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 the claimant uh, is not educated enough to know that there was a notary bond involved. In the alternative, sometimes there's uh, the attorney who doesn't understand that there may be errors and omissions insurance that the notary may have. And I'm certainly not going to volunteer that information to them either. So again, my, my typical uh, approach is when there's a case where there's been clear notarial liability and significant damages, is to get in, start negotiating fairly early on, and trying to uh, get the case settled uh, for less than the uh, amount of the uh, E&O policy. If there's just a bond, however, and some notaries have the perception that a bond is insurance, but that it is not insurance. Uh, this is a, a bond that's for the benefit of the public. And so if there's a loss suffered on the bond, then the consequences are significant because the notary will have to uh, face the potential of reimbursing the bonding company for its losses, but also face the, the likelihood of a uh, suspension or, or um, 
forfeiture of their uh, notary commission. And you have run into cases where, despite what you try to do to shield the bond from exposure, you know, the the E and L policy has to get tapped out, and it does bleed over into the bond. Yep, and unfortunately, sometimes that happens. Um, you know, normally, if I'm going to be paying out more than the E and O policy, it's a case where the damages are significant. Uh, let's say a hundred thousand dollar, which is, I'd say, your minimum real estate fraud type damage case. And so, typically, I can, if push comes to shove, uh, settle uh, at uh, most for the amount of the uh, E and O policy uh, and throw in a portion of the bond or the entire amount of the bond. Okay. So now we've been talking up to this point about notaries who've done something wrong, but have you ever had a case, and can you tell us about a case that you've represented a notary who didn't do anything wrong? Oh, it's, it's, it's happening more and more. Uh, there's three or four different scenarios. One is when a homeowner is just trying to avoid a foreclosure and they're going to uh, one of the, the standard uh, assertions is that there was some type of fraud involved in the loan and it's easy to name the notary and say the notary uh, notarized the forged deed. Oftentimes the notary has clear evidence that there was no misconduct, they have the signature and thumbprint and usually we can get those cases resolved fairly quickly because we retain handwriting experts and other experts to prove that there was, in fact, uh, a valid uh, signature and, and uh, notarization. Also, uh, more and more prevalent is uh, the copying of the notary seal. Uh, I don't know how they do it with PowerPoint or, or I mean with uh, Photoshop, Photoshop uh, but I, I get a call out of the blue from a notary or, you know, after speaking with the notary, they go, hey, I have nothing in my journal to indicate there was any notarization. That is not my signature as notary on this, and but, it, but the seal looks identical to theirs and all the information is identical. But then we have a third example where someone has actually gone and fabricated a fake seal. I have one case where the name on the seal is a derivative of our notary's name, but not the same name, but the commission number is the same. And we actually established that this was uh, a seal that was uh, manufactured by a different company than uh, the notary obtained, uh, or obtained their, their seal from. Uh, but in any of those cases, while it sounds like it should be a slam dunk to get the notaries out, uh, these uh, plaintiffs' counsel uh, oftentimes make you put up a pretty big battle to, to extricate them, even when they did nothing wrong. And, you know, how much would it cost typically, do you think, if you could get, you know, to tell us, when the notary didn't do anything wrong, and best case scenario, the, the notary didn't have to pay losses, they still have to pay your costs or, uh, or some attorney's fees, and just give our audience a, 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 a kind of what that would involve. Right, well, well what I, getting back to just my modus operandi, in a case like that where I'm convinced our notary didn't do anything wrong, I'll communicate quickly with the attorneys for the other side and provide whatever evidence we have to establish that our, there was no notarial misconduct and then cooperate with them to try to avoid even having to respond to the lawsuit. The expense of even filing an answer in a lawsuit, there's court costs that now in California average $400 just as a filing fee. There's my time and effort. And so I'd say at a minimum, it's about $1,000 just to get involved in that initial investigation. Okay, great. So now uh, for our audience, we have a poll question for you. Uh, go ahead and answer this question. What should you do if a claim is filed against you? Should you immediately contact the NNA or your bond or E and O insurer? Get an attorney, discuss the case with the plaintiff's attorney, or tell the plaintiff's attorney to call your E and O insurer. We'll go ahead and open that uh, poll and go ahead and take a take a take a whack at answering that question. And a number of you voted. We'll give you about another five seconds to vote. And we'll go ahead and close the poll, Dwayne, and share the results with our audience if you would. And um, yes, uh, the, 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 the overwhelming majority of you answered um, uh, contact the NNA or your bond. 
uh, or insurer. Richard, what uh, should notaries do well, uh, if a claim is filed against them? This, unlike some of the prior questions, was not a trick question, and the answer is obvious. Well, there may be a normal tendency, if you have an attorney to, uh, that you use for other purposes, to contact them. Your best case is to get someone who handles this stuff all the time, and your best source of obtaining that type of uh, representation is to immediately contact uh, the NNA or the bonding company. Uh, the worst thing you can do, although it may be human nature, if you don't think you've done anything wrong, uh, most of my notaries are, are just so overwhelmed when they get served with a lawsuit uh, that they may have a tendency to uh, immediately call the plaintiff's attorney and try to discuss the case with them. But very rarely can anything good be accomplished if, uh, if you're communicating with that attorney. Uh, they oftentimes will try to uh, uh, dupe you into signing a declaration that may be uh, not necessarily altogether accurate, uh, and that will set you up with, uh, with exposure that is very difficult to avoid. If you signed a declaration or provided information, uh, and especially uh, if you tell them that you have uh, an E&O policy. As I mentioned before, we, we uh, don't want to reveal the existence of E&O policies unless it's absolutely mandated. Well, so this is interesting because, like, uh, you know, we all, we all drive and we all have car insurance. Um, and if I'm in a car accident, the first thing I do is pull out my proof of insurance card and hand it to the driver and say, oh, you know what, I've got insurance. You know, you know, we'll get our insurance companies involved. So if I hear you correctly, that's not what a notary should do in this case. Right. And again, it is maybe an unnatural thing, but uh, it's very important not to communicate uh, with, at all with, with, with these attorneys that are on, on the opposite side. And the minute they find out you have insurance, uh, they're just going to start uh, trying to get more and more out of uh, out of the insurance company, even if you did nothing wrong, because they just view it as a, a deep pocket, and uh, there's a very uh, a variety of strategies they can utilize to uh, put pressure on the insurance company once they know there's a policy. Okay, so what can notaries do? What steps can they take to protect themselves against claims, Richard? Well, uh, first and foremost. Um, is to adhere to your notary laws. Uh, you know, it, you, you guys go through the courses, you take the classes, and I'm sure most of this audience is well aware of all the laws, and when they hear some of my horror stories, they're shaking their heads in disbelief. But following uh, the laws in terms of making sure that there's a, a personal appearance, that the uh, circumstances are, are not suspicious, and um, that there's just no uh, nothing to indicate that there's that there's going to be uh, a problem with the notarization. Um, and the second point is uh, making sure that you get a, a notary journal record of the uh, notarization. Um, it, it's so imperative. That, you know, in California, that's required. I think there's a number of states that don't require a notary journal, but certainly uh, California law requires that there be a notary journal entry. And if my notaries do not have a notary journal entry and they have notarized the document or they have lost their notary journal, uh, it is a very difficult situation for me to represent them. Okay. Um, now, as an attorney representing notaries, how important is the journal to you? Well, as I just said, it's, it's imperative. Uh, as I said, California law requires that they have a journal. If they've lost their journal, they're required to notify the Secretary of State. If the journal's been stolen, they need to file a police report. What, what happens is if I have the notary's journal and it's a nice, clean journal with all the necessary information, uh, it establishes the notary's, notary's credibility and that they are a good notary. And so in cases where there has been, uh, for example, a, a fake seal involved, the notary did not notarize it, I used the notary journal to establish that there was, in fact, no involvement of the notary. 
And so I show that journal to the opposing counsel to establish that our notary did not do that uh, forged deed to begin with. Whereas if it's the case is one where our notary did do uh, the notarization, uh, having especially the thumbprint and signature so that we can use that to verify whether, in fact, the person signed the deed or not, or if an imposter came and uh, utilized the fake ID. Uh, the fact that, that there was an imposter does not make our notaries liable. They can only do the best they can. And, you know, in California, there's many bad people out there who can make fake IDs that look very realistic. And so our notaries aren't guarantors that the ID they relied upon uh, was valid. But as long as they have a well-documented journal, it makes my, um, my job uh, significantly easier to get them out of the case. Or if there's been a, a, some type of uh, irregularity, get them uh, maybe resolved it at a very small payment. So how, as an attorney representing notaries, uh, can you help limit losses on claims? Well, you know, as I said before, uh, I have a game plan that I've developed over several years doing almost exclusively uh, notary representation. And it involves me um, first getting all the information from the notary, making sure that uh, I have a copy of their notary journal entry, an understanding of what, what's transpired, getting copies of the relevant uh, documents, obviously re reviewing the lawsuit in detail to see what the claim of the, uh, against the notary uh, is. And uh, then I will, after interviewing the notary and hearing their story and assessing the situation and the, the likelihood that there was mis misconduct or not, I will then communicate with counsel. And again, there may be a number of different possible claimants, so I can't necessarily just communicate with one attorney. It's often a number of different attorneys, but my primary objective is to figure out a way to get the notary out of the lawsuit as quickly as possible. Uh, and if, if there was some liability to try to limit the, uh, the attorney fees that are incurred by all parties by uh, trying to, to resolve the case as soon as possible. And then finally, last question, then we're going to take some questions from the audience. What are the advantages of having the notary errors in emissions insurance policy? The peace of mind component in and of itself uh, is, is just amazing. I get calls from notaries, and the minute they start talking to me, you know, usually it's been a week or two of sleepless nights that they've uh, uh, endured due to the, the fact that they've been sued. They, they don't know how to deal with the litigation process. They, they, they may have been a total innocent victim uh, of identity theft if someone has forged their seal and signature, or they may have done nothing wrong, or they may have done something wrong. But the, the peace of mind of knowing that they can have an attorney and have some level of insurance protection is, is imperative. As I mentioned earlier, my goal is to get in and uh, the policy is usually sufficient to uh, resolve a, a case where our notary has, um, has committed some type of misconduct. And in cases where the notary has not done anything wrong, get them out without them having to pay. If, uh, if a notary, as, as we discussed, is improperly sued and they don't have insurance, they're facing a, a po possible claim against their bond, uh, the, the most important thing in the world is to have an insurance policy so that they can uh, call upon an attorney with an experience like I have to uh, hopefully get them out of the case very quickly. And how does the e &O policy protect the bond, and why is that important? Well, as I mentioned earlier, the bond is not an insurance policy that protects the notary. It protects the public. And so if the uh, bond is the only uh, option available, then uh, the bonding company may well hire me, and I will uh, attempt to defend the, the, the issue of whether there was notarial misconduct, but if there's exposure on the bond, then the notary will uh, be uh, likely looking at uh, um, uh, a suspension or revocation of their, uh, of their uh, commission, as well as the duty to reimburse uh, the surety. So the, the, having a policy along with the bond 
allows me to get them out of the case without any impact on their bond. Hopefully. Right, because you know, in, in many states, if your bond, if, if there's a claim paid out against your bond, the secretary or the commissioning official must be notified. And often the, the commissioning official will suspend the commission until a full bond can be procured. That's right, and I, uh, I'm assuming that uh, once the notary has, has lost the, the bond from one, one company, it's very difficult to get one from another. Uh, and they also face more and more, I've seen, where notaries are being fined by the uh, Secretary of State for uh, some irregularity in their book, whether it's uh, and without a suspension or revocation, they're still facing some amount of monetary penalty. And actually, it is a criminal uh, misconduct, uh, misdemeanor, and could possibly be worse than a misdemeanor in California if the not not notary has uh, violated the notary laws. All right, we have one more poll question, then we'll go to your questions. Uh, what one statement is the most valuable takeaway you learned from today's webinar? Um, was it the discussion of the types of acts that result in claims, the ins and outs of how claims are filed and handled? what to do if a claim is filed against you, the precautions you should take, or the value of an E&O insurance policy and attorney representation. I see a number of you have gone ahead and voted. Please uh, go ahead and let us know what you found most valuable. And we'll go ahead and share the poll here. We'll go ahead and close the poll in about two or three seconds. Dwayne, go ahead and share the results with us, please. 25% of you indicated um, that the discussion of what to do if a claim is filed against you and the precautions that you can take to, re, uh, to reduce claims were uh, important. But the other uh, three aspects that we talked about were almost as important as well. So thank you for the feedback there. And with that, we'll go ahead and answer some of the questions you submitted. Thanks so much for um, submitting them. So Richard, we have, we have one um, attendee who says, what if you're uh, doing a notarization and your life is threatened or you sense your life is in danger? Um, uh, should you proceed or can you, should you get out of there? What should you do? Well, I've had a case like that. Um, and clearly, if your life is threatened, you do the notarization because your life is more important than, than anything else. The most important thing is when you have been uh, in a situation like that is you get in and out as quickly as possible. Again, this goes back, though, to suspicious circumstances. The case that I dealt with was a, was a situation where our notary should just never have gone where she went. But she <laughs> went to a, a dangerous location to perform the notarization. They not only forced her to do the notarization, but then they strong-armed her notary journal from her. But the, the essential thing in a circumstance like that is that the notary immediately go to the police, file a police report, immediately contact the Secretary of State, advise them of what's happened so as to prevent any uh, allegation that they uh, did something improper. So this next question is interesting. Um, you know, we talked about the value of the journal. And there are a number of states, over half the states, don't require notaries to keep journals, like here in California. So the question is, what about the states that don't require a notary to keep a journal? How can uh, an errors and emissions insurance policy defend uh, in a suit where there's no journal evidence? Well, I don't have experience with uh, states that don't have notary journals, and uh, but I could certainly imagine many instances where uh, a notary counsel can defend the case by proving that the signature is authentic yeah. and also based on the uh, testimony of the notary about the, the facts and circumstances surrounding the notarization. Um, but uh, and I, I think uh, NNA even urges the, those notaries outside of the state, uh, state, state where there is a notary journal required, that it may be a good idea to keep that journal anyway. And, you know, it's uh, one thing I've been thinking about lately is oftentimes people ask me, well, why don't they copy the identification uh, when they do this to prevent all these allegations that the notary didn't get the right ID? And I've been thinking about that, and I'm thinking, you know, that may well become a, a very good idea in the future 
uh, in, uh, with people with their cell phones that have cameras. You could take a picture of that uh, identification and uh, save that in some type of file where you can, uh, in the future, access it. And if we have a picture of an identification uh, that, that corresponds with our journal or in a case a state where there is no journal, that would be a, a, a very valuable uh, uh, evidence to support the notary's position that they did nothing wrong. So a notary in L.A. County, here, uh, here us, uh, Richard, uh, wants to know if, if an elderly or ill person has capacity uh, and understands the purpose of the document but is blind, should uh, they proceed with notarizing uh, the person's signature? You know, that's a difficult situation. Um, clearly, uh, you cannot discriminate, and you know, under California law, and I assume probably every state, a, a notary is a public official, and they are charged with the responsibility to notarize uh, for anyone uh, that comes to them, as long as it appears to be a proper uh, situation. And so the fact that someone's blind uh, per se uh, should not pre uh, preclude or inhibit the notary from uh, doing the notarization. It certainly presents uh, problems and issues. I think that uh, in the event that that uh, occurs, and I have had one case where my notary actually, uh, the person could only put an X for their signature. Uh, it did lead to litigation, and the issue was the, whether that person really did know what they were signing signing and whether they had the, the, the necessary mental capacity. So those are, uh, that's a difficult question. I think in that, in that circumstance, uh, if you were going to perform the notarization, you need to have some credible witnesses that are uh, uh, at, the, at the notarization who are confirming that the person understands what document they're, they're, they're uh, signing and um, so that, uh, and to make sure you get that, those credible pe people's uh, uh, information so that uh, they can support you if, uh, if subsequently someone claims that, uh, that the, 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 the person did not have capacity. And these elder abuse cases are becoming uh, not more frequent, but I'm facing them, uh, I guess, a little more frequently than I had in the past, where it's uh, real easy for uh, uh, someone who has been disinherited or, or has lost their their interest in the state by virtue of an uh, elderly person deciding to transfer uh, the property, uh, let's say, to his new wife, his uh, spring chicken wife from uh, who's 30 years younger. It's real easy for uh, an allegation to be made that that notary uh, should have realized that the person didn't have capacity. A couple more questions. A couple of uh, notaries asked, Richard, they were, I think uh, their interest was picked by the, the comment about not divulging insurance. So uh, one, a couple have asked, you know, should I not advertise that I have insurance on my website, or should I put my amount of insurance that I have on my business card? Do you have a no, comment? I, I, that's a little uh, far afield from an area that I probably should make too many comments on. Um, I don't uh, think there's anything wrong with uh, with uh, having at least an indication on your um, on your business card or website that you are insured, but putting the amount of insurance on there, uh, I don't think is going to help you one bit, and uh, could likely lead to uh, uh, the discovery by the attorney for the claimant um, uh, of the, the existence and the amount of the insurance. And, you know, ultimately in litigation, they're going to find out about uh, the insurance if they uh, push uh, too, too uh, hard or too fast. However, um, again, my goal is not to reveal the existence of the insurance policy or the amount of that policy until it's absolutely necessary. So, you know, we mentioned earlier the point, and this is be a good question for clarification, about fraudulent identification being presented to the notary. And um, we have one uh, attendee who wants to know what kind of liability does a notary have if the notarization's been done correctly, but the notary has not noticed the signer has a false ID? Well, right, and it's, uh, with the sophistication of the fake IDs uh, nowadays, um, it's virtually impossible, I think, for a notary 
to know for sure whether the uh, identification is, is valid. Um, so there's very few steps that can be taken. Um, you know, of course, I see that some of the uh, NNA products that uh, have a little, you know, like they use at the airport, uh, you know, something to scan. Yeah. Yeah. And from my standpoint, even if those aren't totally effective, they, if the person's a crook and the notary pulls out something like that, they may decide they want to get the notarization done by, by somebody else who's not quite so conscientious. Uh, but um, in those kind of cases, again, the existence of a, a well-documented notary journal, um, you know, the identification, if it's fake, usually includes a, um, the, 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 the right driver's license number. It includes the right address. It just has a different picture. And uh, so what can a notary do? The, they're going to put in their journal all the information and evidence, and it's uh, really at the point in time that I'm involved, it's a he said, she said situation. It's going to be the credibility of the notary who's going to say, I, rel I did everything I did uh, in conformance with my requirements. And again, the uh, notary is not a guarantor. And therefore, they, they, uh, I, the law is fairly clear that the, the mere fact that there has been a forgery uh, uh, based on a, um, a fake ID does not per se uh, create notarial liability. Thank you uh, for submitting the questions. We are uh, right at the one hour point at this, at this point, uh, and we don't have time to answer any more questions on the air, but Richard has graciously uh, offered to give out his email address and has welcomed you to correspond with him. Uh, so if you have a question for Richard that we couldn't answer today, feel free to reach out to Richard uh, personally and, uh, and answer the question and he'll, he'll get back in touch uh, with you. And um, again, we want to thank you today for being with us. We uh, again apologize for the late start, but uh, we will be back uh, in another uh, two months with our next uh, broadcast and we'll be uh, giving the title and the invitation for that a particular uh, webinar uh, then. So be looking for that uh, in about a month or six weeks or so. So on behalf of Richard, thanks Richard for being with us. We appreciate You're welcome. It. It's been my pleasure. And uh, the crew here at the NNA that helped us pull off the webinar, uh, thank you as well. And for all of you who joined us, have a great day.